so I guess I'll start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series. I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean of Berkeley Haas. I am so excited uh, to be introducing today's guest, Al Kelly. Uh, and I'll start out by giving you a brief bio, and then I'll plunge into the Q&A. So, Al took over the helm as Visa CEO in 2016, where he has served on the board of directors since 2014. Last year, he was named the chairman of the board. Prior to Visa, Al was president of the American Express Company, where he worked for over two decades, and he was responsible for running a number of its most important operations. Most recently, Al also served as president and CEO of Intersection. Interestingly, his career has seen him take leadership roles in a much wider range of positions than fintech companies. For example, in 2014, he was the chairman, president, and CEO of the New York, New Jersey Super Bowl host committee. And in 2015, he chaired the 2015 Papal Visit Committee for New York City. So Al is truly an exemplar of our defining leadership principle beyond yourself. He gives of his time and his leadership to numerous philanthropic endeavors. Uh, he has done this throughout his career. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, Visa is our first recipient of the Berkeley Executive Education Leader in Lifelong Learning Award. And one of the reasons that we gave that award to Visa is that since Al Kelly became the CEO, he has fostered a deep organizational commitment to leadership. At Visa, everyone's a leader with responsibility to take ownership for making things happen. Uh, and at Berkeley, here at Haas, Visa has been a fantastic partner, both in the co-design of our transformative executive edge program for senior women leaders, and they've also been a top partner in our open enrollment program, serving the needs of individual leaders with, with Visa. So um, on behalf of all of us here at Berkeley Haas, Thank you all for being here today, and thank you, Al, for coming. We look forward to learning more about your leadership through your varied and successful career. So please join me in a warm welcome for Al Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. You're welcome. So let me just jump right in and talk about the company, Visa the Company. So Visa is one of the most well-known brands in the world. I personally have a Visa card. I use it a lot. Um, everyone, Thank you. <laughs> uh, everyone in this audience has likely heard of and or paid with Visa. But if you ask the audience what Visa does, my guess is we may get a lot of different answers. So how do you, as chairman, and CEO describe Visa? In, in, in a number of ways. Uh, you know, one of the things I've said to people is I, I think of Visa as equivalent to air. Uh, you step out of your house every day, you wake up in the morning, and you don't have to think about whether you can breathe or not. You just breathe. You don't think about it. And uh, we are the biggest network in the world. Uh, and if you travel anywhere, even to the outskirts, not just to big cities and the main streets of big cities, but small cities and the outskirts of small cities, villages, you most of the time, you know, at a very high percentage of the time, you will be able to use your uh, Visa card. We have 3.4 billion cards around the world that are accepted at we actually don't even know how many. We, we know it's at least 61 million, but in that 61 million, Square, PayPal, and Stripe only count as one, and they e each have signed up tens of millions of places that accept Visa. So the number is probably much closer to uh, 100 million or, or uh, more. Beyond that, there, your question is very relevant. A lot of people, you know, I can't tell you at least once a week, somebody says, 
when they find out I work at Visa, can you take care of my credit? Can you pay my card off? Can you get me a higher credit limit? And I, I can't do any of that. Uh, and it's not because I'm useless, but which I, I might be, but it's the fact that we uh, Work, we, we sit in a two-sided model between banks that issue cards to consumers and businesses and the people, the sellers on the other side. And so basically, fundamentally, we're a business-to-business -business technology company. We're also one of the greatest consumer-branded companies in the world. And I like to think of us as a solutions-oriented company, that we want to be very innovative, looking around corners, thinking about what could be and what might be dreaming and, and aspiring to all of that so that we're, we're a step ahead in providing assistance to the 16, we have 16,000 financial institutions that we work with around the world uh, and these, call it 100 million merchants, and we want to be continually bringing value to them, and that's something that's very, very important to us. So being solution-oriented is an important part of what we're all about. But we, the when you have a Visa card, very interestingly, I'll bet you, if I went around the room, many of you don't know who the bank actually is. Uh, but Because in essence, you, you call it your Visa card, but it's, it's actually from some financial institution that has made the decision to give you the card and give you a credit limit. We, have, we don't have any say in those decisions about who gets a card and what your credit limit is, and we have no credit risk, which is one of the unique aspects of our company. All the credit risk sits with the 16,000 financial institutions. So that brings me to my next question. What kind of major trends do you see in this business in the next five to 10 years that are going to affect you? There's a number. Obviously, the growth in e-commerce and digital uh, commerce is huge for us because as smart as even you guys are, I haven't met anybody who knows how to put, a, a, put cash into an iPad or a laptop or a mobile phone. So in the world today, in a face-to-face -face world, 15 cents on, of every dollar spent around the world will be on a Visa card. In the e-commerce world, 43 cents of every dollar in the world today will be on a Visa card. Uh, because our biggest competitor is Cash Inc. And Cash Inc. doesn't work in e-commerce. So that's clearly a big trend. A second big trend is low-tech solutions to allowing somebody to accept digital payments. So it, until about five years ago, you would have to have a telephone line or some form of telecommunications plus a physical device in your store, whether you're... Walmart or a small little shop in Bangalore, India. Today, we have solutions that are very low tech. You can put a piece of cardboard on a wall with a QR code, and, th and this is what happens in many instances in, in different countries in Southeast Asia, where you then download to your mobile phone an app you shop, and then you, the phone reads the QR code, and it captures what you have spent and sends the money to the merchant, and the, the money will come out of your bank account. So it, you, didn't, you don't need any of this hardwired, telephony-based background. We're working on cloud-based technology where your phone or, or an iPad it becomes your point of sale device, but doesn't have to have any of the intelligence. All the intelligence is in the cloud, so that we, over time, will be able to turn any mobile phone, any iPad, uh, any tablet, why am I doing an Apple announcement here, any tablet or, or uh, any uh, laptop can be turned into an acceptance device. So the fact that there's this low-tech solution that allows pretty much anybody with an idea to sell any good or service to be able to accept digital payments right away is a huge step forward. It's interesting that it's very low tech, but it's a huge step forward and, and quite innovative in what's, what's been, uh, in, been developed. There are increasing amounts of wallets developing around the world, and a lot of these wallets are, tend to be closed 
ecosystems initially. And the reason these wallets uh, end up getting involved in uh, they typically don't start thinking that I'm going to have business don't start thinking I'm going to have a wallet and have to think about payments. But we estimate 1.7 billion people on the face of the earth are outside the financial mainstream. So they they can't have, they don't bank. Uh, they don't have a bank. Many cases, unfortunately, don't even know what a bank is. And so we we need and so like somebody like GoJack, which you may be familiar in Southeast Asia, kind of think about it as an Uber and then some in Southeast Asia started as a, created a wallet where you could go and deposit cash so that you had a, you had a base of payment in this wallet and then you could go shop. But then what they realize is that building a network of bringing buyers and sellers together is not an easy thing to do. So now we're working with GoJack to put prepaid cards and debit cards in the wallets of their, in, in those GoJack wallets. And that's a huge increase in our distribution channel to get a lot more cards out there and start to reach some of the people that are under or uh, unbanked around the world. And the last thing I would say is that uh, you know, regulation always plays a role in our lives. And uh, some of that regulation is helpful and some of it is not, not so helpful. Uh, and uh, and by the way, sometimes it can be helpful and not so helpful within the same country. Uh, so uh, uh, Dean Harris and I were talking before, I spend a lot of my time talking to governments or around the world, trying to educate them and hold, ultimately try to influence them in terms of what's, what's best for their citizens and, uh, and, and to ha be basically more open-minded in how they think and, and little less restrictive on, on uh, some of the regulation. So um, on that note, um, people are increasingly realizing that shareholder profits can no longer be the only goal of corporations. That's something that we talk a lot about here at Berkeley Haas. You often talk about Visa's commitment to be a purpose-driven company. Where does Visa fit into the purpose versus profit conversation? So I think instead of versus, it's and in in my mind that we have to we have to have a purpose and we have to make profits. So I, I think of us as having responsibilities in f five areas. We have responsibility to the planet we have, that we all share. We have a responsibility to society in general. Thirdly, we have a responsibility to the communities in which we live and work. Fourthly, we have a responsibility to the people who make Visa happen, which is our employees. And fifth, we have a responsibility to the people who own the company, which are shareholders. And we, we need to be, if, if we're a purpose-driven company, we, we need to be trying to make inroads against all five of those levels. So we just, uh, a couple weeks ago, announced that we had reached 100% renewable electricity across Visa, which is a big deal for us when we run these huge da data centers. We're not carbon neutral yet. We're trying to figure out how to get there. I mean, most of our, our uh, fossil fuels are related to people commuting to work and traveling on airplanes. And that's, unfortunately, a lot of people have to, well, we're not letting people travel very much because of coronavirus right now, but on a general basis, we have people flying around the world all the time. And you know, th these airplanes, obviously, and th that fuel is, is putting fossil fuels in the air, but you know we're 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 working on our plan and committed to get to carbon neutral at some at some point. When we think about uh, societies, you know we have an obligation to make sure that we respond to emergencies ar around around the world. Uh, we have a responsibility to it, it, to be as inclusive as we possibly can. When we think about communities, we encourage volunteerism and, and giving back. You know, on Giving Tuesday last year, we had 3,800 people donate over $4 million to something like 2,500 different charities. We had, here in California, 40,000 hours of volunteer time last, last year, and which I think is very uh, underreported because not everybody puts it in the system, and, et cetera including myself, but we're fixing that this year. I'm going to put my own volunteer hours in. Um, 
you know, we, we have uh, put one of our executives on Tipping Point, which is a big organization in San Francisco to fight the homeless situation, which, you know, I desperately see every single day. I walk 20 minutes from my apartment to the office in San Francisco, and it's just awful. Yes, yesterday morning, I saw a man in the street, lying in the street, and uh, a San Francisco policeman, and I have a lot of respect for law enforcement, but San Francisco policeman on, on a motorcycle pulled up right next to this guy and turned his siren on as loud as it could go. And this was at probably like 6.30 in, in the morning. I'm not quite sure that's the best approach to solving the homeless situation, but we want to be part of trying to, to do that. One of our executives is on the board of uh, the medical center at uh, uh, UCF uh, so that we, we can help in any way we can from a uh, healthcare perspective, which is obviously a big deal in the world, but particularly a big deal in uh, uh, America. We have one of the biggest foundations in the world. We didn't have one when I got to Visa. Uh, and we're, we now have $450 million in our foundation. Uh, we're, our biggest commitment is to uh, uh, small, mostly women-owned businesses, because we believe that small businesses lift up communities. Um, and uh, so we made a $20 million commitment to Women's World Banking, and we're in the midst of, uh, relatively soon, probably in the next couple of months, we'll make a major announcement about a few other grants that we're going to make uh, out, of, out of our found, foundation. And then, obviously, our employees are critical. We, we, uh, we took the first action we took after tax reform last year was to dramatically increase our 401k. So at, at Visa now, uh, if you, you can donate up to 5%, into your 401k and we'll double match it. So you can get 15%, uh, which is amongst the best there is in the country. Because it was important to me that if we we're going to get a, a tax advantage from uh, tax reform, that we ought to uh, give some of that immediately back to our employees. And, it, and back to health care, people are going to live longer. I'm really worried from a public policy issue about how people are going to live when they're 75 and 80 and 85 and 90, and you guys will live to, a some of you will live uh, to 100 and 105 and 110 maybe even with the advances in health care. But, you know, if you retire at 65 and you don't start saving early, which I would tell you, you ought to start, especially if you're young and you're not married or whatever, start saving to the max in your 401k when you, you, you start. I'm going to move the topic to leadership. So, Al, how do you define leadership? I think leadership is about both intellectual as well as emotional balance. So I think you have to, you have to be able to set a vision and a direction, because if you can't, then you're going to just have chaos. So you have to have the ability to set a, a vision. You then have to have the ability to attract good people. Uh, because if you, if you have a great vision and can't attract good people, you're, you're not going to be successful. In fact, good people can make up for a less than good strategy. right? They, they, you, you should get the vision and strategy right, but you, you have more leeway to screw that up than to screw up getting the right, the getting the right people. And then, then you've got to have the right balance of being able to be uh, uh, tough, uh, open, communicative, empathetic, and genuine so that people will, at the end of the day, follow you. And the ultimate, the ultimate measure of, and the ultimate compliment of good leadership is followership. That people, if people will follow you, and what, what does that mean? Like they, they if, you, if something needs to be done this weekend, they'll drop things and get it done. Uh, if you go to another area, they wanna come work for you. I mean, in, in the extreme, it's that people who don't even know you, but because of the reputation you have built, want to come work with you. That, that's kind of the extreme of great followership. If, if you're a leader, that is what you want. That, that's the, it's a very simple measure. Do you have followership? 
And if you do, you're a, there's no question. We can then talk about what all the great techniques are that you might do, but then if you have followership, I know you're a good, you're a good leader. If you don't, then the, 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 there's some flat sides there somewhere. So that's how I think about it. So who in your life influenced your leadership style and, and in what ways? You know, I don't know what people think about uh, things like birth order, but I'm the oldest of seven children. Um, and the first five, my sister, who's fifth, was born like seven years, six, less than seven years after me. Um, so, you know, obviously I think my parents, um, my father was the CEO of a company. Uh, so I learned a lot of the basics from him, and I try to teach those to my children. I mean, and still lots of people don't have a hand, good, firm handshake, a smile, call people by name, look people in the eye. I mean, I, you know, these are things that, you know, anytime somebody's you know, doing one of these things to me, like a wet noodle and looking down, you know, I think, <laughs> I think about my father wanting to kick their ass, saying... <laughs> Look them in the eye and, and give them a you know a real handshake. Um, so my father may, you know pushed me on communication skills early. Like I I was a lector in church doing the readings on Sunday when I was in grammar school, uh, and yeah I was nervous and shaking. But thankfully there's a podium in front of you that's hiding some of your shaking, but it helped me start to get much more comfortable at an early age to, to speak and hone my uh, communication skills. And my mother was an incredibly creative person, and she always looked at things. She, she would make us birthday cakes every year in the, in the number of your birthday. So if you were two, the cake was a two. Or if you were 14, the cake actually had two parts to it, a one and a, and a four. Um, she used to give people for birthday presents, if somebody was turning 40, should go find a penny from each of the 40 years that you had been on the face of the earth and, and build a plaque with them. Uh, she just was, was is, both, both my parents turned 90 this year, my father in May and my mother in, in August. And so I learned uh, a lot about creativity from my mother. I, a lot of times I see myself thinking, well, the simplest thing to be, would be to do this, but what would mom do? Um, so they were very influential. And then along the way, I've just been a sponge, and I would tell you the same thing I tell my kids and I tell people at Visa, is that the, one of the greatest qualities you can have is being curious. It's one of my favorite words in the world. Be curious. Look for things that others don't look for. And, uh, and, and be committed to be a lifelong learner. And what I say to our folks all the time is every single meeting you're in should have two objectives. The first objective should be to contribute in that meeting the way you need to contribute. The second objective be, would be to watch how more senior people operate. You know, how do, how do they or don't they, by the way, you can learn as many bad things as good things. How do they keep the meeting on, in order? Uh, how do they deal with somebody who's trying to take them off on a tangent? How do they pull in somebody who ha you know has something to say but happens to be more shyer and won't necessarily speak up? How do they deal with things that are irrelevant to the discussion? How do they try to come to closure? And by the way, on all of these things, or not. And, and you can learn a lot by being a lifelong learner, by watching in meetings kind of ha how people interact with people. And, you know, I've learned a, a lot from those kinds of things. There's, uh, employees today at Visa influence me all the time. I mean, I pick up things uh, from people much more junior than I who do things that I, th I walk away and say, that was kind of a cool way they approached that, or that was a co cool or interesting way they thought about it. Um, and so... I don't believe, I, I, you know, I think we should all be liberally stealing from each other uh, and learning from each other. So, so along those lines, how, how would you spot leaders? You have 20,000 employees. How do you identify leaders among those employees? And how do you ensure that they're prepared to move up in the organization? Well, as the company grows, I mean, we were 5,000 people 10 years ago, and we'll probably be 30,000 people five years from now. Um, 
it, it gets harder, obviously. You know, for me individually, um, I, uh, before I go on any trip, I insist on knowing who I'm going to see, insist on getting a picture of people so I can put a face with a name. Uh, I will ask people who the stars are so that I can watch them in action in meetings and see if I ag agree that it appears that they are a, uh, a star. So uh, in my case, it's asking a lot of questions and doing a lot of preparation uh, in advance. I, it won't be, it's not an uncommon thing for me to say, you know, I want to have a lunch with uh, directors or vice presidents who are kind of the middle of our company uh, when, I, when I'm somewhere else in the, in the world so I get to see them uh, and, and hear from them. I will observe somebody I observe in meetings, like, right? So I, I, I watch people and say, well, and I'll commonly come out of a meeting and say, boy, Mary was darn impressive. Is that the way she is all the time? But net-net, as we get bigger, we have to have a, a more a process-driven approach where we're uh, getting input from various people and identifying them. You know, you guys help us with this um, uh, Leader's Edge uh, program that we do with the Haas School where we pick 30 to 35 women every year, put them through a, uh, a year-long program. They're not out of work the whole year, but intermittently throughout the year. They do classroom training and uh, speaker series and, th and things like that. Um, you know, so sometimes in those programs we, we find, uh, you know, unbelievable gems, and sometimes we find that, you know, we pick somebody who maybe we shouldn't have picked for the program, but that's okay, too. We're, we're learning. And we'll do talent reviews. We, we're going to do, in, at the July Board of Directors meeting, we're going to spend four or five hours talking about talent at Visa. And I'm doing that at the board meeting for the board's benefit, for sure, but it's also a forcing device. So between now and July, I have individual talent reviews set up with all of the executive committee members of Visa, where they have to answer to me first in terms of the people in their organization, and then from there we'll pull it together for the board. Okay, so um, at, at Berkeley Haas, we're really focused on teaching uh, innovative leadership, uh, entrepreneurial thinking, uh, and in Visa's 60-year history, it's really been a catalyst for payments innovation. Uh, our students see you as an incredibly innovative and entrepreneurial company, and in some ways we could say you're the first fintech company. How do you create in such an innovative company, and how do you motivate people to be that innovative? First, I love the fact that you called us potentially the first. I talk, has, talk about us as being one of the great fintech stories of all time, you know, with it. Depending, well, I don't know. I haven't analyzed it since the coronavirus on, and the impact on the markets on Monday. But as of last week, we were, you know, the tenth largest market cap company in the world, with the least amount of employees by by far. Um, so I think we're we're a great fintech story. Look, it, it's part of. I felt it when I was on the board. Uh, that the company just had it in its DNA that it was just m much more innovative. It was much more innovative, in my opinion, than it was at American Express. And maybe that's shame on me that that was the case. Um, and probably, you know, certainly I probably did have some culpability. Like, we're constantly, Visa is a very interesting company, it has a great culture. Uh, it's, the, it's the least siloed place I've ever worked. It's really team oriented. The company runs on time. Like, it's amazing. Like, uh, it, it, it runs like a top. Uh, meetings start on time and end, end on time. And we just put a large premium on, on solutions, which is what I talked about earlier. And so that, orient, that mindset of solutions just has people thinking, thinking about it. And we're investing in it. We have 2,000 people in our product organization around the world. And, you know, those people are paid to think about What's on the current products? What's wrong with them? How could they be better? On the the needs out there that our products aren't solving, what can we do to come up with a a a, a better uh, answer? We're out there talking to our customers. What's what's their, what are their points of friction? What are their concerns? What are their issues? And we love just as a culture, just love solving problems. And I think that that 
that drives a lot of it. And then obviously we invest behind it. You know, we, we, we've invested $7 billion in technology in the last five years. Uh, it's pr probably no better place to work from a cybersecurity standpoint. We have a thousand of our 20,000 employees work in cybersecurity. Because obviously that security of, a, when you run something like us, uh, our network is like a water system or electrical grid. And we have to make sure that it is as safe and as sound as it possibly could be. So I'd like to believe we stimulate it. You know, 52% of our employees are millennials now. And uh, you know, I just think millennials are coming out because of the the education they're getting, and, and certainly that you guys are getting here at Haas. You, you're just you have you're more wired to be innovative and more excited about uh, about it. And you know, that that's great. That's why we like to recruit here because then you just become kind of a natural part of our culture in terms of driving innovation. So, so you're the CEO of one of the largest and most successful companies in the world. What, what factors do you think has, have contributed to your success? What would you call has, has really made a difference? Well, I, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not about me at all. I, you know, I'm, I'm never the smartest person in the room. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's all about surrounding yourself with good, good people. And I, I, my philosophy is that we need to attract the best talent we can, but you cannot attract and retain and motivate the best talent without having a passionate commitment to leadership. And that's why every employee at Visa gets rated, gets two ratings a year. One on how you did versus your goals, and one on how you did as a leader. And so in the past, if you just kicked it out of the ballpark, uh, I guess hit it out of the ballpark. Um, did you see the article the other day about people, uh, analysts asking CEOs, uh, well, what inning are you in on a certain initiative? And there's like the story about like five or six different CEOs who kind of got it wrong. My friend Gordon Smith said the other day, I don't know how many innings there are in a game. Somebody else said, well, I think we're in the eighth inning of a 17-inning game. Uh, but any, anyway, it used Even to be... Even I know the answer to that. <laughs> it, it used to be that if you did really well, but you beat the heck out of people to get there, you'd get a great rating and a great bonus. Now... That's not going to be the case. You could get a very high rating on, on uh, what you got done, and you could get a poor rating on how you got done. And I instituted this because I wanted to send a strong signal that I wasn't just talking about leadership, but it was going to, it was going to drive people's compensation. And it was going to hopefully, therefore, that would then, compensation is one thing, but what I really wanted is that it drives their mindset. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that people join companies and they leave leaders. That they, that if you're unhappy, and I'm seeing my old, I have five children, my older four children are in the workforce. And uh, they, I, I see it. Like they're, they're, they'll talk to me about their direct boss. A, you know, and I, the, you, you, and people have to realize this, that when you're managing, whether you're managing one person or a thousand people, your name is being talked about at home. Maybe it's being talked about to like perfect strangers. There's people who are going to say, well, how's your boss? What a jerk. You know, and I, I constantly ask people to think about if somebody asked, how's your boss? And you, you, you were able to listen to what they had to say, how satisfied would you be with what, what you heard? So that's why I'm in, I am maniacally committed to having great leadership in the company, uh, because if we have great leadership, we're going to attract great talent. If we have great talent, we're going to win. So let me ask about the global parts of your company. Visa facilitates commerce around more than in more than 200 countries, um, and uh, you're incredibly global. I can't imagine a more global company. What advice do you have for Berkeley Haas students to help them prepare to be leaders in a global firm like Visa? So uh, you have to have some element of kind of global standards or principles, but businesses tend to be local. 
Uh, you know what what you know, what we do in Germany is very different than what we might do right next door in Austria, uh, and uh, you have to be able to be have a strategy that allows for local ad, 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 adaption. And so as you go and think about being a local a global company, you have to think about building that company from the bottom up, that it's a series of, of countries that are different. They're different because of history. They're different because of the government structure. They're different because of the laws of the land. They're different because of the uh, habits. They're different because of the mindset. I mean, think about a country like Germany, which is still a huge cash economy. Japan, still a huge cash economy. Mexico. So in each of the th in three of the continents, you've got these huge economies that are top 10 or 15 economies in the world that are still uh, hugely uh, cash. So you have to think globally. You have to think about colleagues and where they are in the day. I, I want Visa to be a global company that's headquartered in the United States. I don't want it to be a U.S. company with international outlets. And there's a big difference from a mindset standpoint as it relates to that. So we, we think very hard about when we have conference calls. We don't try to make it so that the U.S. is always in the perfect time and overseas you know, is up in the middle of, of the night. Uh, we, we, we cannot get, there's 12 people on the executive committee of Visa. There's not an hour in the day that works that everybody can be on because one of our members is in London and one is in Australia. So we rotate and we do it once a, we do it every week for an hour. One week we do it at 7 a.m. Pacific time and the next time we do it, and the person from uh, Australia can never make that. It's the middle of the night, and it's the end of the day for the person in Europe. And then we do it the next week at you know, four or five in the afternoon, so the person in Europe's asleep, but the person, it's morning in Australia, so that person. So you have to, you gotta think about your teammates. Your teammates are, are truly global, and they're living in different places. You gotta think about holidays. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot, some of these countries have a lot of holidays. <laughs> uh, and so I actually think about it when I travel. I don't want to travel into a country on a day that's a holiday and then people have to come in and work. You know, in, the, our, in, in Dubai, which is our headquarters in the Middle, Middle East and Africa, most of the Middle East actually, their weekend is Friday, Saturday. So their work week is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So like we try to stay away from meetings on Friday with people in the, the Middle East, because it's, it's their Saturday. I mean, I'd, I'd be mad if somebody started calling a bunch of meetings on Saturday. Um, and you have to, the last point I would make, Anne, is that you have to make every market important. So, you know, we have an 80-20 rule like every other business has, where, you know, 20% of the markets generate 80% of the volume. And, but the reality is we have to make every market feel good. So if, you know, if a market is doing $10 million in revenue last year and they do $15 million this year, like we should be giving them high fives, right? They've increased their volume, their volume of the revenue by 50%. $15 million is a rounding error for us. Um, but in that country, it's like a home run. And we're increasingly moving our goaling and our compensation system. We're not right where I'd want to be, but we're moving there where, you know, it'll follow that somebody in a country that does what I just said, goes from 10 million to 15 million, can have a huge bonus year uh, versus, say, a big market that goes from, you know, 10 billion to 10.1 billion. So I do want to give uh, the audience a chance to ask questions. Um, and so this is going to be the last question that I will ask, and, and then we'll open it up to hear what, what you want to say. So my last question to you before we open it up is, what's the best advice a mentor ever gave you? Well, one is uh, acknowledge mistakes and fix them quickly. Um, you know. Uh, the one, I'm a fairly even keeled person. I'm not sure everybody here would agree, uh, but I, I am. 
But the one thing that sets me off is somebody not telling me the truth. Because um, I can't solve a problem if I don't have the data. And the truth is data. And uh, so, you know, I've, I've made plenty of mistakes. And especially when you make a people mistake, there's a temptation when you make a people mistake to say, oh, it'll get better, it'll get better, it'll get better. You know, about 20 years ago, 20, maybe 25 years ago, I fired a vice president four months into hiring them. And I, you know, you can imagine the HR is like, what are you doing? And then the person's like, what are you doing? You didn't, you didn't give me a chance. Now, by the way, I had given feedback along the way. But the reality was that that person was managing 50 people. They all hated his guts and were going home every day miserable. But the reality is you gotta, you got to own up to mistakes and fix them quickly. And by the way, publicly acknowledge it. Like in this particular case, I said I made a mistake. Um, so I would say that's one of the biggest things I'd say. I, I think the other one is from something my father said earlier. You know, I don't care how techy the world gets. Communication skills are critical. And everybody should work on them. One of the best classes I took in college, I, where I went, you had to take a speech class as a freshman. And it was one of the best classes I ever took. Just like in high school, I had to take a typing class, one of the best classes I, I ever took. I, I actually can type with 10 fingers and don't have to look at the keyboard. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it's communication is so important, guys. Don't underestimate it. And I'll tell you what I always tell my kids, too, is do not assume that email is a place where you're allowed to be terribly informal in a business setting. You know, typing you, the letter U instead of Y-O-U. I've had this debate with my daughter. I know it's that I'm typing three times the letter she's typing, et cetera. But you don't assume informality in email until you reach a point where you can assume informality because of your relationship with that person you're emailing with. But be be as buttoned up as you would. You know, I, I were, unfortunately, I had an advantage that you would probably find terrible. When I started working, it was, it was typewriters. And so if you got anything wrong, you had to type the whole thing over again. Um, so uh, you know, I, I learned to be really careful about what I wrote and my sentence structure and punctuation and all that stuff. You should have the same mindset. If you're not comfortable in public settings, get pump comfortable in public settings, or at least get comfortable in meeting settings. Uh, learn to figure out how to speak up and contribute. The, it, it, communication skills are critical. It's, it's critical to teamwork. It's critical to uh, good, good sharing of information. It's critical to moving up in, in your career. Thank you. Thank you for telling us that. So now you have an opportunity to ask questions. You need, if you want to ask a question, make sure it's a question. So it has a question mark at the end. Make sure it's only one question. And if you can go to the microphones and ask your, your question clearly, um, we'd love it. So who wants to ask the first question? Oh, and can you give your name and state? Your yeah, hi, I'm a Double Shima alumni at Haas. MBA. Uh, thank you very much for this conversation and thoughts. Um, my question was about your thoughts on uh, Bitcoin, short term, medium term, long term. So, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, I think Bitcoin is more of a, uh, a asset than a payment vehicle. Uh, and uh, I think it remains to be seen whether it will ever really be a payment vehicle as opposed to a kind of a, you know, just an asset like gold or, 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 or silver, so a commodity for, for, for trading. I do think central banks around the world are getting increasingly interested in cryptocurrencies, but I think they're much more interested, which I would be, uh, would be a, uh, in agreement with, that we make sure that they're fiat currency backed as opposed to more speculative, where there's not really a proper marketplace for, to deal with the, the pricing of the asset. My name is Alankar. I'm a first year MBA. Um, I know VC invests in emerging markets, for example, Nigeria's into switch. Um, how do you expect investments like that to drive increased financial inclusion and uh, increased profits? So we're really excited about that recent investment in InterSwitch. Uh, you know, they aspire to be a, a big player 
throughout Africa, not just in Nigeria. Uh, Africa, to me, is an oasis for growth, uh, not next year or the year after, but we're, plant, we're trying to plant seeds throughout Africa. We have now offices in, I think, 10 or 11 countries throughout Africa. Uh, there's some really exciting things going on in the mobile space there. And uh, I, 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 I'm really excited about it. I'm making a trip there later this year, visiting some countries that I haven't been to in Africa, but have the, you know, as you guys know, there are a lot of the hugest populations in the world are in Africa. So I'm going to get to Ethiopia as uh, an ex example. So I, we're, we're in the mo one of the things we have to do is make sure we invest in the things where we can drive volume this year. But part of my job is to make sure that we're planting seeds around the world to drive volumes five years from now and 10 years from now. And Africa, uh, China, some parts of Southeast Asia, a couple of countries in South America would all fit into that category of places that we're planting seeds. Hi, thanks so much for being here today. Um, I, as part of a class project, I'm actually working on looking at fintech disruption. So would love to ask you today what you're most excited about as far as what fintechs are doing to meet previously unmet consumer needs or, or B2B needs. You know, I'm not sure I can say it better than you just said it. I think that um, there's a lot of fintechs that are, are, are filling like holes in the dike uh, in in the financial ecosystems of the world. Um, you know, again, when I was younger, there was the whole notion of this installment plan. You know, there's a number of fintechs out there now that are offering the capability to, uh, not, they won't call it revolve, but make, say, six or five or three payments at the time that you actually go to, go to uh, uh, buy. Uh, fintechs have opened up the world of acceptance in a big, big way. Uh, so I, my view is I, I don't look at them as disruptors. I, uh, I can accept why somebody would use that descriptor. I, I view them as potential partners and in many cases as real partners today who are, uh, have real value to add. So our philosophy at Visa is we'll talk to anybody, anytime about anything, and we're going to assume they're going to be a part, can be a partner until such time that they prove that they're, uh, you know, they're more interested in, in trying to hurt us than us helping them. So it's exciting space. Hi, um, my name is Jing Wei. I'm a Hass alumni. Just Hi. graduated. Congratulations. And I started a fintech startup. I have a question for you regarding the future of Visa. How you're gonna say it? How do you picture the future of Visa being future proof? And how do you see your biggest competitor in the future? Well, we have made a, a very uh, important set of decisions. Um, over the last couple of years that we, we just did a big investor day, uh, which is st uh, still, I think, available on our website until for a couple more weeks if you're interested in, in looking, uh, where we did six hours and 263 PowerPoint slides. So there's more than enough that you'd want to know about Visa. But the, a couple of decisions we made. One is we are pivoting from being involved in payments to the movement of money. So we want to be in the middle of moving of any money or funds anywhere in the world from anybody to anybody and not just facilitating payments. Second, and this might be like a da kind of thing, we for 57 years, we pushed, uh, we, we pulled money from bank accounts to pay sellers. And the, the network worked in one direction, we pulled money from bank accounts. We're now reversing our network and we're, we have many, a, lot, a big business that we've built of pushing money to bank accounts. So for example, at the end of a shift, an Uber driver now can decide they want to get their money at the end of the shift as opposed to, you know, in a paycheck every two weeks or once a week. And they, they can send, have, notify Uber that they want their money in immediately. And Uber uses Visa to push the money from Uber into the bank account of that driver. We have huge relationships with a number of insurance companies. So you, you have an auto claim or a, a personal property claim. Instead of the insurance company putting a, cutting a check, which is expensive, 
putting in the mail, they'll use Visa to push money from their bank account into the bank account of uh, the uh, claimant. We're powering all the big P2P systems in the country, Venmo, Square, Apple Pay, Zelle. You move money P2P from one person to another using Visa in the background to, to move that money. The second thing that we have said strategically is we don't want to be a network. We want to be a network of networks. And so we recently bought one of the, you know, what we think is a great fintech in, in Plaid, which is a, a very different kind of network than ours. Uh, six months ago, eight months ago, we bought a company called Earthport, which allows us now to reach the bank accounts of uh, virtually everybody in the world in the top 50 markets around the world so that uh, we, again, helps us move any kind of money to anybody everywhere. So I think this notion of uh, moving money versus just being in payments, being a network of networks versus just being a network. And then the third thing I would say is that we've put a great emphasis on selling value-added services, and we want to make the sale of value-added services a real engine of revenue growth for us over the next uh, 10 years. And then the last piece is the geographic piece that I was answering the last question. You know, there's still lots and lots of cash being used around the world. We, we estimate seven, between 17 and 18 trillion dollars of cash. We're the biggest network in the world. We did 11 trillion across the, the globe last year. There's 17 trillion of volume just to go get from cash and check. And that's in the consumer space. In the B2B space, the number is 120 trillion dollars. Hi, my name is Frank, undergraduate student. And I want to ask, what do you think of Alipay in China? Do you have any idea to maybe entry ancient markets to get more markets and to change the uh, payment habits of the local people? So um, we were talking about this earlier. We, these has been in China for 37 or 38 years now. And we still don't have a domestic license. Uh, we have deals with 55 banks in China. Those banks issue visa cards, but those cards can only be used by Chinese citizens outside of, of mainland China. Uh, as part of the uh, U.S.-China trade deal that was just announced, uh, China's committed to open up the market to what they call electronic payment systems, us. And uh, we're working hard now on completing an application. Uh, and uh, we're excited about you know, ultimately getting into the Chinese market. What Alipay and Tencent through WeChat have done is nothing short of fabulous. I mean, they've been very impressive. They've done a great job. Um, so when we enter the China market, we're going to be behind. And we're going to have to be very segmented and thoughtful about what we do and, and how we grow in that market. But it's such an exciting market with 1.4 billion people that uh, you know, the prize and the size of the prize is large. And it's, it's worth being patient and worth investing uh, for the long term there. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you. My name is Ayush Dave. I'm an undergrad here, a uh, freshman at Berkeley Haas. And my question was actually regarding the um, recent license that you guys got from China. Um, how do you guys negotiate relationships with new governments and especially developing economies that could drive growth from cash to cashless societies in the future, and especially those that may be resistant to your technologies like China has been? So we don't have a license yet. Uh, the trade agreement opened up the possibility of it, and we're in the midst of discussions with the Chinese government now. But as you can imagine, the coronavirus has kind of taken st the, the stage and is priority one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, but our hope is to break, it, break in soon. Uh, it's one of the few, mark few countries around the world where we're not. Uh, we, we're in every country around the world but the f uh, five the U.S. has sanctions against, which are Cuba, Crimea, Syria, Iran, and North Korea. We we're, we're operate everywhere else in the world. We have uh, uh, operations. So, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to, you know, to banks, to, uh, uh, sorry, to central banks, to finance ministers, to 
uh, government leaders. Uh, you know, in some countries, it's important enough that, you know, I get an audience with the, the president or the prime minister. Um, and, uh, you know, we tell our story. Uh, you know, global networks are shrinking the world. Global networks are facilitating a, a lot of great things for consumers and businesses around the world. And I am surely biased, but I think, you know, we have the best one. Well, on that really positive uh, note, I think we, we, we are so fortunate that Al Kelly has come and spoken to us today. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm so jealous that I'm not in your seat. Make, take every moment of being here and uh, just in, enjoy it uh, tremendously. It's a great school and uh, in a great location with a terrific dean and a great faculty. Enjoy every minute of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.